With that said, let's get on with it. Uh, tonight's broadcast will be the eighth edition of the Direct Action series. Unlike the political means, which requires subjugation before those who claim to be our rulers, the ec economic means provides you with the ability to take the initiative yourself in creating the freedom you so desire in your life. In the first hour, we'll take a look at uh, culture jamming by talking to Corinne Bermudes, the ex-drummer of Anchor Lines and founder of the Never Known Band, uh, solo band, uh, rather. Uh, in the third hour, we'll be talking about free-range parenting uh, with Lenore Skenazy. And in the final hour, I'll play, play the uh, spoken discourse for the newest edition of My Adventures in Illinois Higher Education series, which I suppose could be considered a form of whistleblowing, another item on the FUDA, uh, but I'll leave that up for you to decide. So I, I guess first, before we, before we bring in uh, Corwin, I, let me provide a little background. Uh, Corwin was the drummer of the now uh, defunct band Anchor Lines, uh, which will always remain a favorite of mine. Uh, they played two shows in Peoria, Illinois, about 45 minutes away from me, and they're definitely one of the chillest fucking bands I've ever had the pleasure of hanging out with, and uh, uh, I've, I've, met, I've met a lot of bands, so uh, definitely uh, means something. Uh, after their sh last show here, which was probably, I, th I think, two years ago or around, around there, uh, I remember sitting outside with Corn for an hour or so just discussing how fucked up the world was and uh, about, ver about various conspiracies as well. Uh, that being said, I've had a, uh, a few bands on in the past month, and I remember that uh, I had yet to bring him on the broadcast. I'm not quite sure why. But uh, after leaving Anchor Lines, he began a solo project called Never Known and released the first EP and two music videos within the past month. Uh, so without further ado, Corwin, uh, welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio. How are you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing good, Shane. Thanks for having me. And also thank you for you know kind words about my band and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Usually when I reflect back on Anchor Lines, uh, my usual thoughts were just like, man, it's super exciting that anybody cared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and that's not a problem. Definitely not a problem. But yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing that uh, your guys' band was able to actually come to Illinois because I know a lot of um, a lot of smaller bands uh, struggle to even get uh, uh, like on the East Coast. They struggle to get uh, outside of their own state. So that's definitely definitely incredible. Yeah, and uh, playing in Illinois was sweet. Um, I think next to actually no, ahead of St. Louis, like Illinois is definitely like my favorite show that I've played so far, especially like outside the New England region. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, good deal, good deal, good deal. Um, so uh, here's how I see this first hour going, just to kind of give the listeners an idea, and and, and you as well, Corwin. Uh, we'll discuss anchor lines uh, for uh, uh, anchor lines and never known for in this uh, first segment, and uh, then when we come back from that break, we'll do fascist book, and then we'll kind of just talk about the issues. Uh, so first off, uh, Corwin, uh, tell tell the listeners a little about yourself and uh, and what you do. Sure. Well, I, I guess there's not a ton to tell. Um, I've been playing in mainly metal bands for the past. Uh, 11 years or so. Uh, most recent full band I had was Anchor Lines, which broke up a little over a year ago. And uh, since then, I've been doing a solo project called Never Known, um, where I just kind of wanted to see if I could make a band where I was the only member. Um, I don't know. So it's really cool to be on the show, though, because, um, you know, as I was coming up in bands and everything, um, you know, I kind of had the experience of feeling, you know, the anger and frustration that I think a lot of people who are younger and get into metal kind of experience and then later on as I got older kind of figuring out where that anger was coming from you know what I was observing in the world and how that played into what I cared about what I wanted to write about in the band things like that so um, everything that uh, you know LUA does I think is great I'm uh, you know incredibly supportive of that and it's super exciting to be on well, I definitely appreciate that. I definitely appreciate that. And yeah, I I know what you mean though, because uh, I mean, yeah, with for the past uh, couple of years, I finally kind I finally got grounded within the past year after I started the show. But there was definitely a lot of anger and frustration. Uh, but I, I think the the show definitely matured me, which is good, and I've got a more of a level head. But yeah, there is that point. Uh, and yeah, obviously, obviously, I drum too, so I, I, I definitely had my angry moments to, as well. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, you're, you're definitely correct uh, on that note. So, uh, so Corwin, tell us, uh, tell us a bit about Anchor Lines. Uh, how did that band get started? Um, I mean, kind of like most bands get started. You know, at that point, it was my, I think, third or fourth band, and uh, I really just wanted to get back into playing music. And I think at the time, I responded to a Craigslist ad. Um, from a guy looking to start a metal band and I was like, hey, that's my thing. So while driving to his house and really hoping I wasn't going to get raped, I, uh, you know, was, I, I don't know, just really excited about getting back into that. Um, so, of course, that was like kind of messing around for fun. And then, you know, some other people came into the band that I met through mutual friends. Uh, Jeff being one of the first people who came in. Uh, Jeff was the vocalist of Anchor Lines. Um, and at first it kind of started out like, uh, you know, most bands seem to follow where it was, you know, what do we do to get followers? What do we do to get fans? And then, 
you know, we kind of lucked out in actually having sort of a following first in New England and then, um, you know, sort of on a national scale where people, you know, were tuning into our Facebook and watching our videos and stuff. And, uh, and I think at that point, you know, the priority went from, okay, you know, instead of writing to try and get bigger, you know, what do we really care about? What is important to us? How can we write about things that are outside of ourselves and affect more people than just ourselves? Um, and so I, I think that being able to maintain sort of a genuine approach to the content, uh, I think helped us, you know, keep going for the six years that the band lasted. Indeed, indeed. And you guys, uh, and you guys, you guys uh, remained unsigned throughout, right? That's right. Um, and I think for most of us, staying unsigned no matter what was a big priority, um, especially with where uh, the technology improved, the resources improved, you know, the social community and the the internet community for musicians became really good. Uh, you know, it became very apparent that, you know, we could do most of it ourselves. And the more we could do ourselves, the more control we had. So, uh, you know, that was definitely a big goal for the band the whole time. Indeed, indeed, and yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of seeing that trend here because um, I, I we had we had a uh, Derek Caperton uh, from King Conquer, the cars for King Conquer, on last Sunday, mm-hmm. and uh, they they were used they were signed to Media Scare for a couple of years. I think they released two albums with them, but uh, yeah, they decided to go unsigned as well. Uh, and yeah, with the capabilities of the internet uh, and and social media, it's it's definitely a lot more plausible for bands to just say you know screw the label, let's do it all ourselves. And also just with the with the ease of uh, of actually recording and such. Now, if, if someone knows actually how to do that, it, I wouldn't be able to do it. But uh, but I'm sure I could <laughs> if I if I learned. But uh, uh, so Anchorlines had uh, three three releases. Uh, there was the Choices EP, uh, the uh, 2012 EP, and then uh, the Hollow Eyes single. Uh, mm-hmm. In your opinion, how how did the band progress musically and lyrically throughout uh, throughout those three albums? Um. I think that, you know, over the years we got better playing together, so we weren't afraid to write, I think, more intricate music in terms of, um, you know, writing more challenging and sort of aggressive style. Uh, And then, like I said, the lyrical content really went from, you know, sort of writing about, you know, very kind of selfish and and self-serving things in terms of, like, our lives and our experiences to, you know, acknowledging that we had a platform to sort of express what we thought about the world as a whole. Um, you know, so we express ideas about our, our takes on government, economics, social issues, things like that. So um, indeed, you know, indeed. definitely just maturing as we went from being teenagers to being in our you know early 20s, mid 20s and all that. Also, I listened to the episode with Derek from King Conquer like a couple of nights ago. And I don't know, it was just cool because like I love that band. And so the whole time I was like, oh, my God, I got Derek from King Conquer. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely awesome. I remember messaging him last year, like I only started the broadcast because that, that was something I wanted to do, like for for a while, was interviews since I I love metal and I love uh, metal bands that I talk about real shit uh, mm-hmm. and that uh, that have like a message aligned with freedom. Um, but that didn't, I actually didn't have, uh, didn't actually interview a metal artist or a band until uh, until last month. Uh, so I'm just now kind of trying to reach back out to some of some of these people and, and see if I can get them on, uh, which luckily I've, I've had uh, great success with. So, um, mm-hmm. w- what what ultimately led to uh, the uh, disbanding of Anchor Lines? Uh, I mean, all the story in the book, you know, it got to be too expensive. We kind of hit a wall in terms of the reach that we had. Uh, people wanted to go to college. People wanted to focus on their jobs. Uh, it just kind of wasn't feasible to keep going in the state that it was in, and. I know that at least for myself in particular, I was like, you know, the place I was at was I love making music. Um, You know, I'll never not want to make music. But I I think that there's this mentality for a lot of people who start bands where or kind of follow any passion or dream where the idea is like you have to throw everything away for your dream and sacrifice everything. And, you know, nothing else matters. And, And I don't know, I guess as I've gotten older, I kind of feel like that isn't true. You know, I think if you're trying to accomplish anything, the most important thing is to just be content in how you're going about it and to accomplish it at your own pace. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with working a day job and, you know, making change happen incrementally as you progress toward achieving what you want to achieve. And so that's kind of where I was at. And that's kind of what Never Known was born out of was just I wanted to do something on my own terms at my own pace. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, Very good. Very good. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and go to uh, to. Uh, um, I'd like to play the work video for Hollow Eyes uh, that you uh, put together, so listeners can hear uh, some music and uh, also get get another glimpse into one of your uh, one of your talents. Because you you did do that uh, lyric video as well, didn't you? I did. That took forever. If anybody wants to. 
become a professional video editor. Give up on your dream now. Don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Before we do that, there was I, I did want to mention one thing. You kind of talked about uh, uh, you're mentioning how people think they have to give up every, everything for their dreams. And what you're kind of discussing, we had a, um, a gentleman. The gentleman's name was uh, Jake Desillis, and he is uh, early retirement and financial independence. That was that's kind of his specialty, and he mm-hmm. called it he called it a side hustle. So I uh, get your get your side your side hustle could, could also be used for for musical projects and, and artistic projects as well. Um, that's but a, that's uh, a good term. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a side, yep, side hustle. <laughs> it's pretty much what what the show is. But uh, let's go ahead and go to uh, um, uh, Mr. Producer. Please cue up clip one. All right, bump it. And uh, for those of you who are longtime listeners to the broadcast, that used to be the intro song for quite a while. I have a ba- I have a bad habit. Miss Producer will, will vouch for me on this one. Uh, yeah, I like to switch the intro song a lot. Uh, a few, I think we've had three or four in the past year, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, nonetheless, uh, it's definitely uh, an incredible uh, incredible lyric video. I can I can imagine why, how it, how it takes so long to put that together. Yeah, I mean, all joking aside, it was absolutely worth doing it just because like. I don't know. I, I love how that video looks and everything, and it was really fun to make. But uh, it did take, I think, the better part of a week to make. Gosh, well, I would have figured it would take longer than that. But that's 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 it. I, I couldn't do anything like that. But for even just basic videos, it takes me uh, about a week to do, and they don't look any. They don't look good at all. But uh, uh, but I also kind of mention like uh, um, your your drumming ability as well. Uh, I mean, you've got you've got a lot of talents, and and like uh, I've 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 played quite a bit of Anchor Lines. I've I've tried to at least, uh, and I can get through most of the songs on the Choices EP. But uh, just like Hollow Eyes and Spineless, like the tom work and the snare work is just incredible, and I I can't do that. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> well, man, I've been playing drums for twelve years, so like I'd hope I'd be pretty good at this point. Yeah, oh, know, yeah. You, you, should, you should hear me. I'm like a year into trying to play guitar, and it's still very much like plink plink all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I tried playing guitar too, but yeah, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Um, mm-hmm. I'm too tense of a person to uh, to do anything with uh, stringed instruments. But uh, let's let's move forward to uh, to uh, let's talk about Never Known. Uh, so after mm-hmm. Anchor Lines disbanded, uh, you started uh, you started that project called Never Known. Uh, tell us uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, uh, what is the significance of the name, if any? Uh, how to get started and things like that. Sure. Uh, well, I think probably in the last month or so of Anchor Lines being a band where you know I knew it was coming to an end, and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. I wanted to you know kind of stop being a pussy about it and fully embrace the mentality of like I can do this myself. So I spent the better part of a year building a recording rig at my house. Um, you know, got a guitar, got a bass, learned the instruments, learned the softwares, learned audio production, and. Um, you know, wrote a few songs and then did my first EP, uh, which I released last month, uh, late last month. Um, yeah, I think the name at the time, 
Uh, it kind of happened by accident because as anybody who's been in a band can tell you, trying to come up with the name is the hardest and most annoying process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I came upon like a piece of poetry with I think the author was unknown, and um, I don't know there was it. It was totally like inconsequential to what the poem was about, but the phrase "never known" was in there, and I realized that that was a very kind of perfect way to sum up how I feel about um, kind of like myself, you know, to get very sort of uh, self-centered for a moment. Just the idea that, you know, I feel like although plenty of people sort of respect me and and you know like being around me, few people really understand, I guess, like what it is that I care about, like to talk about what my priorities are. But at the same time, it's very much a self-fulfilling prophecy because I don't give a lot and prefer to stay fairly anonymous and stay, um, you know, quiet about, I guess, who who I am as a person and just let, you know, what I try to accomplish and, you know, what I try to be involved in speak for itself. So that was more or less how the name came about. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, so uh, I guess tell us a little bit about, uh, um, and we'll play we'll play Pies here in a moment. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, kind of tell us about uh, the the writing of that EP, and then also kind of the uh, the lyrical content, how how all that came about. Sure. Well, first of all, I really hope that somebody calls in in a moment and calls me a pretentious asshole for saying that. That'd be great. Um, but I guess as far as the writing for the the music, I mean. I, I very much just wanted to write the music that I liked listening to, you know, in my previous bands, the stuff that influenced me, um, you know, and also what I was able to write with still being new to guitar and bass and everything. But uh, most of the lyrical content is very much sort of like, a, again, like a very kind of selfish endeavor of just, you know, what what was upsetting me at the time? What did I care about at the time? Because I really don't venture into writing lyrics that much. I mean, I threw out all of Anchor Lines. You know, Jeff wrote most of the lyrics. I would help when I could, but trying to come up with with lyrical content wasn't, I guess, a huge priority for me at the time. Um, you know, except for in the case of Hollow Eyes, that one I really fought for to to write a song about that. But um, you know, mostly it was you know I wanted to stick to things that are outside myself that affect more than just me. So it was, you know, things kind of on a smaller scale. Uh, more personal level and then with songs like pious and uh, another e- song off the ep called control it was about sort of um you know the greater issues that face the world in terms of social issues economic issues the lack of freedom that you know most people in the world experience and the fact that most of those people don't even realize it mm-hmm. and also yeah. sort of a, a self-critical aspect of uh, mainly the lyrics of control you know that i think all these things and i believe all these things but I've been inactive about it for a very long time and, and sort of, you know, it was a song to motivate myself to stop being, you know, a non all these bad things in the world and, and become more of an anti all these bad things in the world, actively fight against it. So very good. Very good. That, well said at the end there. Yeah, I, I definitely like I definitely like that and appreciate that. Uh, so you, uh, I've, I've asked this to um, I interviewed, obviously, Derek K. Pretend and King Conquer. And then uh, back in January, I interviewed a band called uh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. I think they're out of New York. And if you haven't checked them out, I'd definitely check them out They're They're mm-hmm. uh, pre- they're pretty fucking sick. Um, but I asked this question to all the all the bands and the artists I, I uh, interview. Uh, what what bands influence you the most uh, in your music? Um. I think even still, like the first, the band that influenced me the most is uh, probably Tool, which was the first band I ever started listening to when I was like eight years old. My dad put Inema in my hand, and I listened to that album until it didn't work anymore. Um, maybe not so much the style of music anymore, but absolutely the approach to it. The fact that they are, you know, 100% genuine and honest and doing exactly what they want to do. Um, I'd say more recently, bands like Architects, Stray from the Path. Um, you know, even like later, like the later structures record I was really into for a while. Um, I don't know. I guess I just feel like with how music is trending now, the impact that, you know, hardcore and metal has is kind of waning, but it really doesn't have to. And I think those are the bands that are really holding it down for that genre and, and making a powerful statement with the music, um, you know, like, like putting a purpose to the anger behind it. So that's kind of what I strive to emulate. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, one of the bands I've been listening to a lot, uh, in addition to, to uh, bands like Fit for an Autopsy. Uh, oh boy, I can't remember any other ones off the top of my head now off the spot, but mm-hmm. uh, but like Straight from the Path, have, have you heard, uh, obviously, their Badge and a Bullet Part 1 and Part 2? 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh uh, yeah, those are those are terrific songs. Now, like, and that's one thing I love about Straight from the Path is uh, is like there are some bands like, uh, I mean, cops really aren't something a lot of bands will tackle, so to speak, but they tackled it and they were very very uh, blatant about it, uh, which is which is definitely a good thing. You can tell by the uh, the uh, <laughs> the outrage in the comments section. Uh, and that's why I, I always appreciate uh, artists and bands that will just step out there and just like knowing that they're going to be ridiculed, uh, and they're probably going to not. They're probably going to lose people. Some some people are going to like the music, but they're going to hate the lyrics, so they won't listen to them anymore. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I guess that is kind of a, that is just kind of a risk, and it's a risk that uh, I'm, I'm glad that there's some some artists and bands that are, are willing to take that. Uh, but let's go to uh, um, let's go to uh, um, Pius real quick and uh, let the uh, listeners check out uh, your new project. So, Mr. Producer, uh, please queue up clip two. Never known. Okay, so to, to kind of follow up with that, Corwin, uh, how has the response been uh, for your uh, EP and also the uh, two music videos? Um, it has been really good so far. Uh, I mean, like any new project, it's taken a while to kind of um, get it in front of a larger audience. But everybody who has you know listened to the songs and seen the videos has you know had nothing but good things to say about it. So that's been really encouraging. Um, I mean, you know, in truth, I have no problem with it, you know, having a very small fan base right now and like not um, getting a lot of visibility yet, uh, just because, you know, at the end of the day, I did it for fun and I did it for me. So uh, I'm just glad that anybody's enjoying it. And uh, also really stoked that you guys are, you know, um, willing to put it up on the show. So. Oh, of course, of course. And, and on that same note, uh, I wanted to kind of mention uh, here on uh, FPR and radio. Uh, on the Freedom Feelings Radio Network, there is something called a Liberty Artist Showcase. And uh, due to the uh, ridiculous copyright laws and intellectual property in general, uh, we uh, we always ask the we always ask the bands and the artists to if we if they want their music played like during breaks. Mm -hmm. uh, or like uh, during uh, the uh, Liberty Artist Showcase segments, bands like uh, Molotov Solution, King Conquer, uh, Born of Osiris, a bunch of bunch of pretty pretty uh, uh, big bands are on there. But uh, would you would you be interested in uh, being put on Liberty Artist Showcase? Of course, that that is not even in question. Thank you so <laughs> I, much. I, I, mean, I, know, I know you have to ask, but like, yeah, I you can put it anywhere. You can use it in your wedding video. That'd be very inappropriate, but you can do that if you want. <laughs> uh, that was actually a thing I wanted to mention too about sort of you know my mentality behind the band. Uh, sort of going into a little bit of talking about you know supporting the um, you know the, the the secondary economy, the counter economy. 
is that, you know, especially when it comes to things like making music where I'm doing it for very little overhead, you know, I feel like the idea is not that I should be remunerated for a thing that I did for myself in the first place. Like it should go to anybody and everybody who wants to hear it. I don't know if you remember, I think it was in the last year or so when I think it was like Taylor Swift put out her most recent album and she pulled it from every streaming site. You couldn't get it on Spotify. You couldn't get it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And the argument was, um, you know, the argument was like, you know, art is to be appreciated and people should be paid for their art and all this stuff. And I I thought about it and I was like, I get it, but also kind of fuck you a little bit. Because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially if you if you have something you want to say and you have something that you're proud of, you know, why wouldn't you want to share it with everybody? Um, I think that that's a big benefit to the DIY motivation is that you get to decide, you know, if you want to try and support yourself on this or if you want to, um, you know, just uh, pursue it on your own and uh, and let it be what it is. Indeed, indeed, and uh, yeah, I remember. Uh, I mean, I, I like Met like I, I, I like older Metallica. I really do, but they've become fucking assholes. I, there was just an instance in the past uh, month where uh, like a cover band in Metallica, like it was like a Metallica cover band or some some name like that, and they actually the Metallica actually sued the cover band uh, mm -hmm. because of their trademark name, uh, like just stuff like that. Such actually, assholes. such assholes. it wasn't uh, Metallica itself. It was their lawyer. Who well, they either, then fired. <laughs> well, either, <laughs> so it wasn't either way. Really, uh, but it was kind of like still they allowed it to happen because, you yeah. know, yeah, they're yeah, lawyers. They, they've, been, they've been guilty of that sort of thing before. So it, was, it, it wasn't anything new with Metallica. But we are coming up to this first break. Uh, and when we come back, we will do Fascist Book. And uh, then we'll kind of uh, talk, talk more about Corin on his views and also some things going on in the world. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back after this short break. In every age, a technology is created that upends the foundations of society. The wheel, the printing press, the internet. Now, in a world sliding into financial chaos, a new technology is changing the way monetary systems work around the world. It is called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a new form of money, controlled not by banks, governments, or corporations, but through mutual commerce between free individuals. To learn more, visit WeUseCoins.com. Doterra Essential Oils, true gifts of the earth, provide you with the perfect prepper tool, the Family Physician Kit. Ten certified pure therapeutic grade oils to provide the care you need for your family's everyday health concerns and potential medical issues you may encounter when sheltering in place or bugging out. Visit EssentialNewParadigm.info to view the complete product line and ask how you can receive 25% off each and every order. Don't, Don't delay. delay. Your, your family's, family's health, health depends, depends on you. you. Health depends on you. This is Niz from Disassociation Nation. As many of you know, I'm an avid vapor. And if you're like me, you're tired of being charged ridiculous amounts of cash for a disappointing experience when flavors just don't deliver. I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to Vapor Renew, a Flavor West company. If you're into mixing and creating your own custom e-liquids, Flavor West has everything you need to make delicious, satisfying flavors. It doesn't matter if you're a flavor chaser or if you love the look and feel of those big, beautiful, puffy plumes. FlavorWest.com can provide you with everything you need. Let's face it, if you vape, e-liquid is an ongoing expense. And if you're a dripper like me, then you know that blowing through a $30 bottle of juice isn't unheard of. Why pay more than you have to? So for excellent quality juice made right here in the United States, head over to VaporRenew.com where they have hundreds of flavors pre-mixed and ready to vape at the most reasonable prices you'll find. Use coupon code RENU for an extra 10% off your entire order. Great juice at a great price and 10% off. Support companies that support liberty by making your next purchase at Vapor Renew. Or for mixing supplies, don't forget FlavorWest.com. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Thanks for listening to FPRN. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to start your own show with FPRN, 
advertise with us, or donate to the network or to your favorite shows, check out our website at www.fprnradio.com. Are you tired of seeing bullshit distractions, fallacious nonsense, and things that aren't relevant to your life coming across your fascist book news feed? Well, we are too. This segment is devoted to showing you the absurdity, irrationality, and overall proof of how well the distraction campaign is going. Liberty Under Attack brings you the fascist book trends of the day. All right, and fascist book for today. And uh, just so uh, Corwin is aware, um, this segment, obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll just read something off there, and then you guys jump in with whatever you have. So, uh, All right, so Nikki Haley, South Carolina governor, comments on Chris Christie's Donald Trump endorsement. Okay? Well, that's well, shitty. <laughs> well, it's funny, because Chris Christie, not long ago, actually um, was bitching about Trump and how unqualified he was or unfit he was for um, presidency. So... I mean, flip flopping in politics, well, of course. <laughs> yeah, I feel like with Chris Christie and and Jeb Bush as well, like the, it was a very strange thing to watch their campaigns because their whole approach was, "I'm going to be, you know, the level-handed candidate. I'm going to be the reasonable one from the Republican side, and and you know, I'm going to give these people what they need and not what they want." And then you know, the election kind of just degraded into this, um, you know, racist, xenophobic shit show. And they were like, fuck, okay, I give up. Like, America, you can have whatever you want, I guess. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this next yeah. one re- relates to the elections as well. And Stan, you can step in. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, Democratic National Committee Vice Chair, steps down, endorses Bernie Sanders. That's always good. You know, supporting openly about socialists uh, always fares well for uh, Well, mm-hmm. technically, they're all socialists, aren't they? Well, okay, fair enough. It is yeah. like the, the the fascists on the right and the and the and the socialists on the on the left, of course. But uh, but yeah, at least uh, he's openly avowed though. Like they'll 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 still say that they uh, care about the constitution and such, uh, and all of that nonsense. But uh, <clears throat> but yeah, and he's more than openly about socialists. I mean, that's that's something else. Well, yeah, yeah, for a guy that's never had a real job, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have got that uh, music from that. Remember that link I added that was the, of the doll that's my Oh, person. yeah. We should have got that audio so every time we mentioned Bernie Sanders, it would be like, my Bernie, my Bernie, that, whatever. Yeah, and, and, what's, and what Stan's referring to is there's this GoFundMe campaign. Apparently these, these, uh, these fucking lunatics – uh, back like b- before Bernie Sanders was like even a factor, uh, they they like made a like a Hillary Clinton like uh, little doll, and they're like raising money for a campaign, and then uh, <laughs> and then like now that Bernie's like the cool thing, uh, they're doing it for Bernie too. Uh, yep. But yeah, it's pretty pretty outrageous, pretty outrageous. So for fifteen bucks, you can uh, you too can buy a Bernie doll. So well, beware. <laughs> beware one dollar does go towards his campaign so buyer beware there yeah That's yeah awesome. if, if they're if they're going to be consistent with their ideology they, they this wouldn't be a voluntary thing they'd like go around to their neighbor's houses and like put guns there and buy this fucking doll and that's what they <laughs> should know, be doing if they're be i was consistent. thinking the same thing and you know pretty much give them nothing in return unless <laughs> you know they're like poor little kids with like coal smeared all over their face and then you just give them a lollipop and be like pat them on the head sorry you're poor give no, them or, or just yeah. uh <laughs> or just have like they make like a 15 dollar donation give them like two or three bucks back and they feel like think they actually like won money uh right, but Corey, like I think a tax you're gonna... return. <laughs> yeah like a tax return but Corey, I think you're gonna step in there <laughs> oh yeah i was just gonna say i think um you know the most successful marketing scheme you can have and this is no exception is you know, pretty much just treat your buyers like infants with money. Just, hey, you, you like shiny stuff. Here. You'll buy it. Yeah. 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 So, Danny, stay anything else before we move forward to uh, the next uh, piece of fascist book news for the day? Mm, no. I, the only thing I can think of is Trump's going to make America great again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's going to make the plantations great again. That's yes, good. he is. Yep. 
<laughs> First order of business reinstate slavery? Question <laughs> mark. No, or well, I, I guess more more so with Trump, it's it's kind of like the uh, the internment of the Americans with Japanese descent in World War II. Like I could definitely see, like is uh, uh, I don't think Trump's going to get his get his wall. They've been trying to do that. Or they've been saying they've been wanting to do that for like at least thirty years. Uh, what I think is more realistic though is Trump might round up all the Muslims and toss them in a, in a in a damn cage. I think that's definitely realistic. And that could mm-hmm. happen. Well, it, it won't be a cage. It'll be a reassignment center. It'll, uh, it'll be yes. a, a freedom a, zone. A, re- a re-education camp. Yes. Mm. Yep. 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 <laughs> oh, let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, found uh, Jean Marie Le Pen, founder of France's National P- Front Party, endorses Donald Trump for U.S. president. Um, why are like people in foreign governments like endorsing? United States presidents. That's something seems wrong about that. Yeah, <laughs> just one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just gonna say I feel like with how Francis parties work, they just kind of look at American politics as a whole and be like, um, "What are you guys doing over there?" So I don't we know. Don't, the idea, we yeah. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like it's just, it must just look like chaos from from there all the time. I don't know. Yeah, Danny, you're gonna you're gonna, guess, gonna say something. Um, well, it's just kind of funny because it's just one slave owner saying to you know another slave owner's like slaves, "Hey, this guy's pretty good." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's all. all right, let's see mm-hmm. what else do we have here. Uh, Claflin University, Bernie Sanders rally held at South Carolina school ahead of state's Democratic primary. Now, why the hell is that trending on fascist book? That happens like every single university. Hell, there, there's one uh, on March 14th at the university I go to. I'm going to hopefully I have to figure out if I can skip if, if I can skip that class that day to go do it. Uh, but I want to go out there and uh, interview some of these lunatics uh, for the Adventures in All Higher Education series. But we'll have to see. I, I'm really looking forward to that. And I actually wouldn't be confrontational with that. All I would really do is uh, I would just give them enough rope to hang themselves with with the questions I ask. And, uh, yeah, I think that would probably be the best way to do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's see if there's anything else important here. Lots of politics today. Not a good thing. Um, all right. I guess uh, I guess that concludes Fascist Book News for today. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and let's uh, go ahead and uh, move forward here. Okay, so uh, first off, Corin, uh, if you had to place a label that most closely, closely fits uh, your positions, what would it be? Like uh, classical liberal, uh, libertarian, constitutionalist, anarcho-capitalist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I guess for me it's tough to even start considering labels just because, I mean, at 26 I'm still at the point of trying to figure out, you know, really how I align and what's important to me and, and, and where that fits into the scheme of, of, of different, you know, ideas of thought or schools of thought, I should say. Uh, I guess if I had to pick one, I'd probably say, you know, like social liberalist, uh, liberalist in the sense that I think that, of course, uh, in my mind, the perfect system is uh, <laughs> uh, the perfect system is a, you know, voluntarist, you know, free market system where it's based on the people rising up to support the needs of the people. But, of course, that takes a certain level of, of, you know, evolution of ideas, which I think that, you know, our society as a whole is not quite at yet. And so the idea is that the role of government is to fill, is supposed to be to fill the gap and, and, and to be able to provide sort of the safety net and the basics that the people need when the free market, you know, in areas where the free market cannot. And I think that we've seen that our government system, you know, not only fails in that, but works against it. And strips away freedom, strips away wealth, strips away the ability to, um, you know, facilitate yourself and and facilitate the needs of your community. Um, so that's kind of where I'd be at. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, okay. So uh, I guess uh, um, you, you kind of mentioned uh, um, the free market and voluntary I- voluntary ideas. I want to kind of mention there's a guy that we had on our show. He's uh, from Liberate RVA. Um, it's uh, an anarcho capitalist community in Richmond, Virginia, and it's in in and my my uh, yeah Cal yeah Cal Molinet. Um but I, like initially that was kind of my my aversion to to I guess anarchism for myself. I I, I went through kind of a stage. I went through a. Uh, uh, I was in a three percenters group for like a week until I realized that they were all they, they had no idea what the hell they were talking about. Uh, then I was in a sovereign citizen group for probably six months, and that was that was 
funny until mm-hmm. uh, I, I left that one. And then after that point, like I was, I was, I was still a constitutionalist, but like I was a disgruntled constitutionalist. Like I, I, had, I had no success with groups. And then uh, through, through through talks with some uh, and private conversations with colleagues, I uh, realized uh, that. Uh, yeah, you know this uh, um, this anarchism thing might actually be, be be where it's at. When I when I came across Cal Maloney's video, he has a, or his videos, he has an entire playlist called "Spreading Anarchy." He just goes out into like college campuses and talks about it. And what's what's interesting now is that he has this, this kind of uh, this this kind of line of questioning that he goes through, and people actually do in their daily lives. Um, more often than not, I think he's like it's ninety ninety percent of the people he talks to actually um, actually already uh, live voluntarism uh, unconsciously. The thing that gets in the way though is government, uh, which is complete opposite of voluntary interactions. It's uh, the threat of and the use of force. Uh, so I mean that was nec- that was my version to it at first as well. Um, but as as far as like uh, philosophical grounding, like the non-aggression principle, the initiation for initi- initiation of force is immoral, like uh, rape, theft, murder, etc., uh, and self ownership, which I, I own myself and the fruits of my labor. Um, so that's kind of that's like just the ba- like the most basic explanation of of, of voluntarism. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, just that the you know one of the ideas that I think has become or started to make more sense in my mind as I've gone on is. Uh, <laughs> Um, is the idea that, you know, you think about what does it mean to have a truly perfect government, a truly free and just government, and it's uh, it's an oxymoron. You know, a, a true government <laughs> is anarchy. A true government or a truly free government is the people uh, taking care of the people. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. and, and removing the need for control, removing the need for uh, order because morality is consistent for everybody. And the goal is not every person for themselves. The goal is the community. And that's one of the things that's been, you know, it, it bugs me about, I guess, modern, quote unquote, mainstream liberalist thinking is that it stops at me. You know, it stops at how do I put systems in place that give me what I want uh, without the, the knowledge that there's going to be some serious sacrifice if you want to have a community that can govern, govern itself and can take care of itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's def- that's uh, that's definitely true. Uh, that is uh, definitely true. Uh, Stan, Danny, you guys have uh, anything you want to mention here? Well, what you just mentioned, um, I think it was Hayek, and he was referring to economics, but he made he had a quote along the lines of um, the arrogance of people is they think they can construct things that um, uh, they can't actually quite grasp fully. I forget the mm-hmm. exact language, but yeah, there's people that sit there and say, well, I'm going to develop this institution that will do things my way. And um, they don't look at the... Uh, this is something I noticed with liberals in general. And it's it's also apparent on uh, Republicans as well. No one really takes into account what is a long-term uh, comprehensive cost of their actions or what they want from government, like how it affects other people. And then they usually use some type of loose um, argument of, well, it benefits us all if we do it this way, too. But the truth is, no, it just we all get kind of fucked Mm -hmm. Um, just a little bit, just the tip. And one guy gets like, you know, all the money for it. It, It's really I don't know. I it just triggered me, I suppose. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there was yeah, there was a, there's a quote by Hazlitt, and for for the listeners still out there, I still have nine copies of Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. So subscribe to and subscribe to uh, LUA email updates, libertyunderattack.com forward slash subscribe. If you make a donation, just put in the notes that you want one of those one of those books sent to you. Uh, just do just do. So I got to get rid of these damn books, but uh, there's a really good quote in there, and, and what you just uh, mentioned, Danny, uh, was what kind of uh, that came to mind um, when when you're talking about the liberals that like they want uh, they want their uh, uh, um, so they want their social security and they want all of this stuff, but they don't actually know the long-term ramifications from from the policies that they're proposing. Uh, but yeah, this is ha- Hazlitt from Economics in One Lesson. Quote, the bad economist sees only what immediately strikes the eye. The good economist also looks beyond. The bad economist sees only the direct consequences of a, pr- of a proposed course. The good economist looks at the longer and indirect consequences. The bad economist sees only what the, what the effect of a given policy has been or will be on one particular group. The good economist inquires also what the effect of the policy will be on all groups, end quote. 
Uh, so I think that's a really, really relevant quote to what you're just kind of mentioning, Danny. I think that's where these, where a lot of these policies, whether from the right or the left, they fall through because, yeah, there may be a benefit uh, um, for for whatever the whatever the right's proposing. There might be a benefit for for one group, and when the left's proposing something, might be a benefit for one group. But uh, what Hazlitt, Hazlitt kind of lays out in this book is is when those when more money is funded towards those programs, um, less money can go to other industries. Um, but, uh, but yeah, do so you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, I was going to bring up the quote from Hayek, which I found. I knew what it was, but uh, it was uh, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate how or to, to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And that, I think, um, is kind of like it epitomizes what I see problematic with people who think that they can Govern better than anyone else, or they have the right idea for government. And yeah, man, they're they're con they're mm -hmm. control freaks, and they don't know anything about the spontaneous order of the market. Yeah, right. and, and I agree with what you're... go ahead. I'm sorry, Corn. Uh, I was just going to say I agree with what you were saying, Shane, about them being short sighted solutions. I think, uh, you know, especially in terms of of talk about economic reform and social security policies, you know, the short sightedness that what we exist in now is a state of economic slavery where our money is debt. And you know, self-perpetuating debt that mm -hmm. will never end. Um, you know, everything is just a band-aid over the bigger issue. And I think even people who are savvy and are paying attention to economic trends, social trends, and who are researching those things are are very adverse about looking at the source of the problem, looking at the follies of having a fiat currency. Um, you know, having a federal bank that operates autonomously. Um, you know, things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely true. That's definitely true, and that's one one thing I like about love about anarchy is because you'll see uh, what with striking the roots um, and like the left and the right will propose policies, but they don't actually know what the actual uh, source of the problem is. So they think fixing toss yeah, like you said, tossing the bandaid on this without actually looking at uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and central planning and all of those terrible, terrible things that uh, literally enslave society. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why financial independence, and you mentioned counter-economics, that's why agorism is so important. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'll give you guys the floor if you have anything to say. Sure. I actually just became savvy to the idea of agorism from the last episode of LUA, and I, I had never heard of it before, but realizing that not only like is it such an important concept, but it's also actually you know much more practiced now. Uh, like you were saying with theme, things like Etsy, uh, Uber, Airbnb, like the concept is there. They're still part of the problem because the the you know taxation is being taken out. They're still in the system. It's not truly free market. It's not truly of the people. But it I think it's introducing people to the idea that they don't have to rely on corporate entities and, and solutions like that for the things they need. Um, I think that you know in the next few decades, depending on what happens with the world, of course, um, that mentality is going to manifest a lot more in reality. So uh, I think that's going to be really nice. But yeah, and I, and I and I definitely agree. When when government becomes, um, excuse me, when government becomes more oppressive and people are getting more and more taken out of, like, say for example, is the Bernie Sanders presidency, mm -hmm. which isn't going to happen. He's going to fuck just like Ron Paul did in 2012. Uh, but so let's just say like Bernie Sanders. Well, it doesn't matter who gets elected, and and they they take more money, and people are uh, are have less money. Um, they're working. They're working more hours, but having less money. Agorism is going to seem really, really nice to those some of those folks. Yeah. Uh, whenever, whenever they become so impoverished, or if like, and, and obviously, like you, you've you've heard like, uh, and obviously this isn't agorism, but just kind of to use as example, like whenever like a mother and a father don't have money for like baby food and they go and rob someplace, um, like that's desperation. But what we need to do is like obviously the instill the the, the values or the the uh, axioms of non aggression and self ownership, and then just have them go well, work in the counter economy and uh, go to farmers markets and that and that's another thing too everyone practices counter economics everyone does like ev I, pretty much everyone i know has been to a free or a, a uh <laughs> a uh, farmers market that's definitely uh, counter economics yeah. or the, you, the difference you, is consciously and unconsciously yeah or people who have used craigslist like you at some point you've practiced the idea of an exchange of currency or wealth between just people like people of the free world so um yeah, and that was one of the things that you know that, that that frustrates me about the the approach to Bernie's campaign in the news in particular is that again it's a very short sighted view of the issue where people look at Bernie as a person who's going to fix all the problems and oh my God it's this revolutionary idea of social democracy 
Uh, but you know, again, it's it's very sensationalized. It's part of the the circus sideshow that is this election. Uh, I think people aren't paying attention to the thought of like, okay, as long as we're thinking about staying inside the system and keeping the establishment as it is, you know, look at what your governors are doing. Look at what your state senate's doing. Look at what city council's doing. Like those are the people who are creating laws and creating, uh, you know, the government structure that, you know, directly influences things, you know, even more than, than the presidency. Um, you know, so there's this like tremendous lack of awareness of how, the current broken system even functions in the first place, which I think is, you know, due in uh, Bernie's success is due in part to that, you know, kind of very almost immature lack of awareness. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and, some, and something I've said on this broadcast a number of times, and, and uh, like those who know, don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And obviously, uh, no one really knows their history nowadays. But uh, when it comes to, to socialism and, the, and some of the proposals that, that Bernie's uh, kind of putting out there, uh, yeah, like you said, they, people think these are like revolutionary ideas, but you don't have to even go into history to see these things. If you look at what went on in Greece, uh, it was a socialist government, and then they had, they had their third bailout, and they elected a... Uh, uh, they elected an openly communist government, uh, Alexis Cyprus of the, the radical left. I don't remember the exact name of the party. Uh, and then obviously Venezuela, which is happening right now. And yeah, all the grocery stores are empty. And uh, um, yeah, that's why the, the Bernie shirt I have, uh, vote for Bernie is vote for bread lines, is so, uh, so pertinent. So pertinent. Uh, don't have to look back into history to see the failures of socialism. I mean, just look at the European Union in general. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's failed forever. And uh, Ludwig, Ludwig von Mises... Uh, pointed this out, uh, and then uh, oh shit, probably seventy years ago in his uh, in his book on socialism, uh, and it can't solve the uh, the economic calculation problem. It just can't. Um, so, yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of funny to watch all this happen. I used to get really pissed about it uh, when I'd see it. And there's actually one rant I had probably back in June. And I was really pissed about it. But now, now I just kind of like I'll see Bernie Bernie bumper stickers, and I'll see people post up on Facebook, and it's like, okay, well. You know, I hope you get what you want. I hope you get what you want because things are going to get even worse. Or uh, kind of the 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 more optimism, op optimistic side I'm going for now is the Bernie Sanders supporters are going to be like the Ron Pauls of the 2012. Ron Paul's mm -hmm. words of 2012, when they get fucked by the electoral college system, and they just don't like they know that like they they can't get their guy in office, so they stop voting or they cancel the vote registration, whatever it is. Um, that's kind of is after what happened in New Hampshire with Bernie. Uh, I think that's definitely definitely plausible. Uh, so that's kind of just kind of looking looking uh, a year down the road and, and trying to see what uh, happens with these disgruntled voters. If they want to go to like mutualism, uh, an one anar anarchist school of thought by uh, Proud Hoon, founded by Proud Hoon. Or uh, even, I guess, uh, libertarian socialism. Uh, as long as it's voluntary and I'm not forced to pay for your system, I don't care. If you want to like get into this little commune and do whatever the hell you want to, that's fine with me. Just don't force me to be in be in your commune. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely interesting. Uh, it's definitely interesting uh, uh, ecosystem we have uh, now in in regards to politics. Yeah. Well, to bring it close to my thoughts on on what we were talking about earlier, because I know we're short mm -hmm. on time. You know, I, I don't begrudge socialism or communism or, or capitalism or anything as an idea. You know, any idea is great on paper, um, but it just comes down to the fact that any any of those are a human system and human systems are easily corruptible. And that's yep. been proven to time and time again. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to people being willing to become um, individualized, being willing to become independent. And uh, to also not lose sight of the fact that they are part of the larger community of people who desire true freedom. Um, indeed, indeed. Um, so we, yeah, we've only got a, a couple few minutes left here. Um, but I wanted to ask, uh, we're, we're supposed to have Lenore Skenazy on. Uh, and since you're up in the Northeast, I was curious if you've, if you've uh, ever heard of if you ever if you've ever heard of her. Yeah, um, I actually remember seeing the story that she that she was involved in on the news back in 2008 when she, you know, allowed her son to take the subway home alone and the whole uh, just crazy media storm that that stirred up, um, you know, very much part of the sensationalized distraction piece news as it was. But uh, <laughs> at the time, you know, where I was at, I was kind of like, oh, that's weird and then didn't think anything about it. But um, when you mentioned that she was going to be the second guest on the show, you know, I looked into more of what free range parenting was and and realized that a lot of my parenting sort of followed that philosophy. And, you know, while there's maybe some elements that I don't entirely agree with, I think that the overall mentality of escaping from fear and escaping from, uh, you know, what society has told you 
is the appropriate way to raise kids is always important, and it's always good to challenge those ideas. So I'm really interested to hear what she has to say in the next part of the show. Very good, very good. So uh, I guess uh, any any closing thoughts, real quick, uh, for the listeners regarding uh, regarding your bands? Do you want to put out uh, put some links out there, uh, or just uh, um, current events in general? Sure. Well, I guess as far as the shameless plug portion, I mean, you can look up my band on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash neverknownband. Uh, I'm at neverknownband on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and if you want to follow my personal Twitter, at Corwin Bermudez, you can. I don't recommend it, um, but it's there. <laughs> um, and as far as a closing thought, I mean, I think the most important things that I would convey to people who are listening is just, you know, never be afraid to... Um, you know, share your ideas, share what's important to you, and tell as many people as possible. Because, you know, as I was kind of touching on before, the stage of evolution that humanity is at now, I think, is the evolution of ideas. And as the ideas become more prevalent and more developed, and people are more open to them, um, we're going to see those ideas manifest in reality more. So. Okay. Very good. Very good. And I, def- I definitely agree with the with the internet today. Uh, it's the uh, huh. Yeah, it's the age of information. So, and that, that's that's another reason I I didn't used to be an optimist, but uh, and I wouldn't necessarily say I'm I'm a major optimist, but I do see uh, uh, definitely a possibility for for more freedom in the future, even if it has to be through agorism, um, mm-hmm. whatever whatever it is, whatever it is. I I definitely think that's possible for people to find uh, freedom in their own lifetimes, and that is that is uh, based off of the freedom umbrella of direct action. So. Um, uh, Corin, I definitely recommend you check that out. Uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Freedom Umbrella Two, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, you might see some stuff on there. There's only there's only a couple things on there right, where it's where it entails breaking the law, but the rest of it is you just do those things <laughs> in your own life to, to create your own freedom and without uh, any threat of the government. So, uh, Corin, mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on to join uh, coming on with us this evening. It was uh, definitely a good in- definitely a good discussion. Yeah, thank you guys so much for for having me. Not a problem, not a problem. Uh, well, you have a great, a great rest of your evening, sir. All right, you too. Thanks. Okay. Yep. All right. And uh, there you have it. Corwin uh, Bermudez from uh, Never...